Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from sunny Miami in the afternoon. We have a multinational crew here today. Uh, we have Victor, we're honored with the presence of Victor Volovici, MD. He's a neurosurgeon from Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I was introduced to Victor from through the efforts of Slavin, uh, a medical student, a neurosurgery lover. And now we have Victor doing the first in a series of microsurgery and neuro and neurosurgery. But first, let's start introducing the panel, and we have Carlos from Ecuador here. Hello, Carlos. Hello. Good afternoon for everybody. Um, pleasure to stay here. Okay, thank you for coming, Carlos. Carlos is a neurosurgeon currently in uh, Quito, Ecuador. He's fr originally from Spain. And Simon, my main man. Hello, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be here. I'm a, a medical student. In uh, uh, studying in Japan, and uh, I'm also a developmental psychologist uh, with also a great passion for neurosurgery. Looking forward. To <laughs> yeah, he's a big force behind these hangers. And Slavin, the gentleman introduced me to Victor. Hello, Slavin. Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Slavin Kukovic. I'm here in Zagreb, Croatia, and uh, I am a member of some student societies, uh, very interested in neurosurgery, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Hey, well, welcome, Slavin. Okay, Victor, welcome. Okay, thank you very much. So let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Victor Volovici. I'm a neurosurgical resident and a PhD candidate at the Erasmus Medical Center. Thanks, John, for uh, for your kind words. And one of the key areas I'm interested in, and uh, it's been a uh, key point of mine uh, for the last five, six years, has been uh, microsurgery. Because I've been um, introduced to microsurgery before I really got into neurosurgery, so. For me, it was, uh, it's been a love of mine, just like neuroanatomy, before I got into neurosurgery uh, as a specialty. So I, I look at microsurgery a bit different than normal people because I got to know it and know it's in and, ins and outs from an experimental perspective, obviously, before I, I even finished medical school. So I did a lot of research in hemifacial transplant and composite issue, tissue allotransplantation, and that's actually my background. So, uh, and then I had to train, obviously, the rest of the people which would be coming to the lab and would be doing these experiments. So that's actually how I got into uh, microsurgery. But ever since I sat down behind a microscope for the first time, uh, I actually had an amazing love. I felt that, you know, I had an epiphany, and um, that the. the the title of my talk today, uh, as I'm going to show you, is Microsurgical Training for, for Neurosurgery. Uh, at this point, pretty clear um, that I'm not really interested in talking about the indications of cerebrovascular bypass or, um, you know, um, how and which patients would best benefit from a bypass. There are a lot of people... Um, who can do this much better than I, and that's um, basically, you know, Japanese groups, the people behind the JET trial, and um, um, uh, like Professor Tankava from Sapporo, and there are a lot of theories uh, as to which patients best benefit uh, cerebrovascular bypass. But what I'm going to be talking about right now is um, if a patient has an indication to perform a bypass, um, what can you do in order to best ensure that your patient gets the right care? So once you've established the right indication to do a cerebrovascular bypass, um, how can you ensure that your technique is adequate enough uh, so that you get the best result and um, the best uh, uh, result for your patient? Um, and once talking about this is uh, taking me a little bit back to, you know, history of microsurgery and um, that's why I always say, you know, honor the masters. And actually, I really don't like people who, you know, once they reach a certain level, forget the masters. You, you know, that's that's something we can, we should always do, and we should never forget about. Um, and it's uh, that's why I've actually set these two gentlemen here on this slide. So this is uh, uh, Harry Bunky. As the first who ever performed a replantation of a rabbit ear in 1964, something which was considered at that point technically unfeasible and uh, basically impossible. And uh, Robert Ackland, who sadly passed away this year, uh, so it's been a pretty sad year for microsurgery and neurosurgery in general. And Wellton has passed, and uh, Bob Ackland has passed in uh, in, in January. Uh, Harry Bunky's already been uh, 
been uh, no more, no longer with us since 2008. But Harry Bunky was actually a visionary because he said, you know, um, uh, I'm going to build my own instruments. I'm going to um, to uh, uh, do this on my own. Um, and Bob Ackland actually got in contact with him uh, after finishing his uh, his studies and uh, um, his residency in plastic surgery in London. And he said, well, you know, he was impressed by everything that Harry Bunky was doing. So he said, okay, I'm going to join you, and together we're going to um, we're going to take this to the next level. And they did. I mean, uh, Harry Bunky is known uh, at the Harry Bunky Center right now. is is known for you know the the most premieres in uh, in the history of microsurgery. You know, they did everything from uh, replantation of a thumb to uh, toe to thumb transfers and you know everything involving microsurgery. And Bob Ackland took the experimental microsurgery to the next level. And at the uh, University of Louisville, where he uh, where he was for you know the remainder of his life. <clears throat> He not only uh, looked to uh, tend it to the future generations of microsurgeons everywhere and actually did what we in the microsurgery world call the Red Bible uh, or Ackland's practice manual uh, for microsurgery. Uh, that's, that's something uh, that, that people training in microsurgery view as literally the Bible because it, it, it lays out in a perfect manner everything which you, you should know about microsurgery. So his book's amazing. But he not only did that, he also had an amazing interest in anatomy. And I think his atlas, which he, um, uh, which he used like nine years to, uh, to build, he had an interest in fresh tissue dissection. He was head of the fresh tissue dissection laboratory at the University of Louisville. And he did amazing dissections. And where Al Roton did the perfect uh, neuroanatomy dissections, Bob Ackland did the perfect dissections for the rest of the body. And I think if you, if, if you guys pick up the uh, DVDs, um, which are um, a part of his atlas, you'll be amazed at the beauty of fresh tissue dissection. And he did that using microsurgery. So he, both these gentlemen had a, a, an amazing interest in not only uh, microsurgery but also anatomy, and this is where it all began. <clears throat> so, in order to um, to see what we can do better for our patients in in neurosurgery, we need to go back in time and see uh, what the gentleman did, uh, which founded uh, what up until that point was deemed impossible. I think it's funny that even nowadays you read uh, in in many articles. Uh, uh, assessments of people who say, you know, that's technically impossible. That's that's reaching the uh, limits of technically impossible. You know, these these kind of people like Bunk, uh, this kind of people like Bunky and Ackland, they laugh about uh, uh, about things which are considered impossible, and they uh, uh, they also give us the future generations uh, uh, the actually an incentive to be better and to uh, take the. Uh, uh, to cross the bridges which have never been crossed before and to show that technically impossible is, you know, uh, as far as your mind reaches and your imagination allows. So, okay, Operation Microscope, everybody knows uh, about them. You know these uh, these new uh, Panteros from Zeiss? E excuse uh, me, Victor. Victor? Yeah? Yeah? Uh, you, you still have the same slide, Honor the Masters. Is that the slide you want? I'm not pretty sure. Is it? Do you see a new slide now? Yeah, sometimes it doesn't move. You might, you may have to click on the left the slide you want to show. All right. All right. So, yeah. do you see the microscopes now, uh, John? Uh, no, we're saying honor the masters. The, okay. The, the slide okay. honor the masters. You might okay, have to click on something else here. All right. Th there you go. Okay. Let me, there you let go. Me, let me yeah. just do it like this. Okay. We see it now. We see it now. Okay. So, you know, operation microscopes. The only problem with them is you have to really think beforehand um, what you're going to do. So, you really have to think be beforehand what's the magnification which is required. Because, you know, normally um, if you're doing a microsurgical operation uh, in neurosurgery, maybe five, uh, a magnification of five or six or seven or maybe ten would be enough. But unless you have the 12.5 uh, oculars, uh, you will not be getting a magnification which is greater than 12 uh, and a half. And 12 and a half is not really the biggest magnification which you should be using for uh, vessels which are under one millimeter. So let's define microsurgery as um, the uh, use of the microscope uh, in um, in the uh, anastomosis of vessels which are under 1.5 millimeters. So extremely tiny, friable vessels, um, which you need to be um, 
uh, anastomosing in order to get blood flow from one side to another. So in order to perform blood flow where there's ischemia in the brain, you would be perhaps using the external carotid in order to uh, revascularize uh, an occluded uh, internal carotid or an occluded uh, middle cerebral artery. Um, the uh, needles which we're using, uh, most of them are 9-0, 10-0, 11 -0, and um, if you're doing super microsurgery, 12 -0 needles, those are needles with a diameter of about 10 is about 100 microns to 75 microns, 11 -0 is about 75 microns to 50, and uh, 12 -0 is uh, under 50 microns, so you can imagine that, that, that the needles are so small that they actually have a diameter which is coming close to the diameter of a living cell, right, because a uh, uh, diameter of a of a normal cell would be about 20, 30 microns. So we're actually, uh, with super microsurgery, we're going so close to um, uh, to the real uh, technical limitations. Um, so 12 o is really, really very small. But if you're, um, uh, the more microsurgery you do, the more you realize that all these specifications, the angle, the arch length, the cord length, and the radius of the needle, they're all important. Because if you're having, if, if you have to, uh, for instance, uh, an astomosa vessel which is located very deep, then you would, so you, you have a, a small amount of workspace, then maybe you would consider the angle and the arch length a little bit lower and the angle a bit, a bit sharper so then you can make a very tiny move in order to get in so you don't have to insert it for the entire length. And if you're doing a very fine um, uh, vessel, which has a very thin wall, then maybe you might consider a broader angle which you would insert more finely. But that's, a, that's really something you get to know. The more microsurgery you do, you realize what the uh, benefits and, and, uh, and drawbacks are of every needle. And obviously, when it comes to needle, everybody knows this, right? Uh, you have uh, cutting needles, and um, you also have the ones which interest us. Those are <clears throat> round body taper point needles. There are also uh, round body needles with a sharp point, but as you can imagine, if you have a sharp point, then um, you're going to do damage in the vessel. And the one thing you don't want to do is damage to the vessel wall, because damage to the vessel wall is actually one of the reasons why we invented this very, uh, um, as humanity obviously, why we invented this uh, very fine technique of microsurgery, because we want to do the least amount of damage to the vessel wall, keep it as intact as possible, but really anastomose it uh, and let the blood flow. So in order to do that, the best needle, um, which has obviously the right diameter and uh, which harbors the right thread, the, the best needle also has a round body and a taper point. So it's tapered at the point, doesn't have any sharp uh, um, tips, and that ensures that you only split the fibers of the of the vessel wall so that you don't tear it. If you would do, if you would use a, a spatulated end, a cutting spatulated end, then you would uh, have an enormous hole which would be plugged, but it wouldn't really be very uh, fine for the vessel wall. So instruments, there are a lot of companies and a lot of instruments which are producing uh, microsurgical instruments nowadays. There are not so many which are producing super microsurgical instruments because super microsurgical instruments really take the limit of what is technically possible at this point. So you have very fine, these, this is before a needle holder, and you have micro uh, scissors, you have the uh, Eklund clamps, so the Eklund clamps which we're using right now and the 10 -0 needles are actually just the same as Bob Eklund had uh, invented them and, and thought about them in, uh, at the end of the 70s and the beginning of the 80s. So that's really an honor to the man that we're uh, still using Eklund clamps. And that's also something where we've actually used my, my, my mentor and myself. Uh, last time we, uh, we performed an anastomosis uh, for dissection aneurysm, we uh, actually brought the uh, um, the Aklan clamps, because they are really uh, very feasible also. Uh, they're mostly used, obviously, for plastic surgery, but they're also very feasible for certain uh, um, pathologies uh, um, in our area. So, you see, there are a lot of uh, uh, forceps, uh, micro forceps, which are available at this point, and their tips vary, range from 0 0.5 millimeters to 0 0.1 and even smaller for super microsurgery. And 
essential is that you not only have the best instruments uh, in the OR, but it, it's actually paramount that you have the best instruments you can have inside the laboratory when you're uh, uh, when you're practicing, and that's uh, actually something that Bob Ackman said because he said, you know, he, I, I really don't agree when people just uh, 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 take the instruments which they don't use anymore and which are bad and they're not uh, holding, the, they can't hold the thread, they can't hold the needle, anything, and they just say, okay, this is for the lab. That's really something bad because bad instruments also make a bad anastomosis. So you need to have the best instruments you can in the lab and in the OR in order to ensure the best result. And this is just a, um, a small slide um, showing that there, there's an arterial clamp and a, a venous clamp. And for all uh, diameters of vessels, um, you use another Ackland clamp. So this is really something you, uh, you want to look into before you begin uh, uh, practicing microsurgery. So for a vessel of uh, of uh, 0 0.4 millimeters to 1 millimeters, I'd use the B1 clamp, but I could also use the B2 clamp. It's really, um, uh, it really depends on how much space you have inside the field and uh, what your preference is ultimately. But you should not be using a clamp which has too little force for too big a vessel, and you should obviously not use a clamp which has too little force, uh, sorry, too, that has too much force for a very small vessel. That's also not bad because if you uh, if you insert, uh, for instance, a B3 clamp on a 0 0.5 millimeter vessel, then you will see that you're actually that the force uh, which is applicated there is actually going to crush the uh, fine uh, structure of the vessel. So, so that's uh, one of the prerequisites of microsurgical skills that you're um, that you're progressing uh, and you're doing everything in order to ensure the proper. Um, a structure of your vessel. That's the paramount. That's really uh, the most important thing of a microsurgeon. Um, and at this point, I also want to talk about tremor because uh, most of people will ask once they start uh, microsurgical training and get to the lab, they'll ask, you know, uh, what do we do with tremor? Is uh, is tremor uh, something we can avoid? Is it? Uh, uh, how do you control it? Well, uh, I think uh, Bob Ackman says it best, and there's actually a YouTube video uh, on this topic, prerequisite of uh, microsurgical skill. Um, and what he's saying is, you know, tremor is obviously something that comes natural. It's a natural state of your muscles, and it's always there. And obviously, it's worse if you've had too much coffee, if you've had too much uh, to drink, if you've had smoke, if um, uh, you've just, uh, you know, uh, ran 10 miles, um, if you haven't slept well, and obviously, if you're stressed. But what he also emphasizes is, uh, and this is really important, you need to know uh, the things which make your tremor worse in order to be able to control them. And not only that, but you should also be able to um, perform the anastomosis, and this is actually part of our training which is a bit different from classical microsurgical training. You should be able to um, uh, perform the anastomosis with all types of tremor and in all types of situations. And that's actually why we sometimes train, you know, after going to the gym, after running, after not sleeping very well, in the most, in the most varied of conditions. Uh, training philosophy is, you know, your patient needs you when your patient needs you. And there's actually nothing um, uh, stopping you from from uh, performing an anastomosis, you know, in the middle of the night if that's really necessary. So you need to be prepared if you want to really do this, you know, to perform it at all times and in all conditions. And obviously there are some days when you'll be more stressed and there are some days when you've had uh, too much uh, coffee and there are certain situations where, where you'll be watched. And, and, and which are more stressful and which will augment your tremor. But that should not be deleterious to, uh, to your ultimate result because you're doing this for the patient. So uh, our training philosophy is train in as varied uh, situations as possible and uh, try to um, uh, mimic all the possible situations which, uh, which you may come across because that's really uh, because that's really the difficulty of this. Uh, you know, you, you, at a certain point you get reflex movements, but this is really one of the few areas in surgery where you can't really let reflex movements dictate what you're doing. This is something which you always, at all times, even with a lot of experience, you always need to control this in order to get the best result. So, 
uh, once you get uh, uh, a needle holder and uh, then you uh, then you get your needle uh, 10 -0. this one's a 9 -0, and it's not really placed properly because it should be at the tip of the needle holder and not really uh, so far away because the most the finest control which you have is always in the tip of the needle holder um, and then uh, you know uh, there's a slide that says microsurgeons do it with a twist so uh, one thing you need to learn is to control uh, the, uh, the three uh, fingers, the thumb and the index, uh, in order to do a beautiful uh, twisting movement of, uh, of your needle. So the first thing you, you want to do is uh, do uh, latex training, rubber sheet training. And that's actually uh, something I pretty much stress in the beginning, and everybody um, is pretty taken aback by it uh, uh, when we start, because I always emphasize this, and th there are a couple of reasons why I do this. Um, you know, the reflex movements I'm talking about uh, should really happen in terms of tying the knot. Tying the knot efficiently and with perfect skill every time should really be, uh, should really be reflex. Where you're going to insert the needle uh, in order to get the best result. That should be something you don't uh, leave to the reflex. It's something which you should always very deeply think about. But once you've done that, the tying of the knot should be a reflex movement which happens with the same precision and the same uh, finesse every time. So in order to achieve this, you need a lot of uh, rubber sheet training. And you know, you can do this, uh, you can just cut up a, a, a latex glove or you can, um, you can use what we call a sun lead disc, for, uh, named after also a famous microsurgeon. Um, and what this teaches you is uh, how to manipulate the instruments how to um, get the needle from one instrument to another, uh, what's the best distance to insert the needle, and how to best tie the knot. And obviously you begin with a very low magnification, so you begin at about three, four, five times uh, magnification of the field, and then you move further to uh, 10 times magnification, 12 times, 25 times, 30 times. Uh, 30 times is pretty big, but you can also use that to control the most, the finest movement and the to see uh, how bad your tremor is, because at, at uh, the more magnification, uh, at a certain point after after about 15 times magnification of the field, you will begin to see that the more you, you the deeper you go, and the more magnification you have, the more tremor you'll see. So your tremor will be amplified uh, proportionally. So how do you how do you do this? Well, unlike uh, normal tissue, you will never ever ever, and that's really something I, I stress. Uh, you will never be uh, uh, using your forceps in order to uh, 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 in order to really get this uh, uh, this side of the uh, of the wound so once you have for instance two vessels you will never um, use your micro forceps to uh, um, get the vessel wall itself because if you do that then you will make a tear in the vessel wall structure so what you need to do is you need to figure out a way in order to not create any vessel damage but still get your needle inside the vessel wall and in order to do that you need to apply this principle of counter pressure from uh, uh, from the underside and uh, pressure from the needle which is entering at a perfect 90 degree angle this perfect 90 degree angle is pretty difficult to get in uh, when you're beginning, but the more experience you have, uh, the more this uh, will become a reflex. But you need to learn it perfectly in the beginning, because if you don't learn this perfectly in the beginning, then it will never become a reflex. And that's one of the reasons why we emphasize basic training so much. And once you've done that, you know, about three times the needle diameter, that's about the right uh, uh, distance to insert it from the edge of the uh, from the edge of the wound, and that's actually very important because you really don't want to be taking too much of a bite or too little of a bite here. This this precision is actually paramount, and once you've inserted it, then you uh, get it on the other side. And here is very important that you actually uh, on this side apply as much counter pressure as you did on the other one, and then that you get. Uh, and that you really uh, don't allow the needle to stay 
uh, inside the vessel wall without any uh, kind of uh, uh, assistance. So once you've got it on the other side, then you immediately grab it with your forceps and, and then take it out. And this is also a very important uh, key point here, is that you never uh, get the, uh, the tip. You should never grab the tip um, of the needle itself, because the needles are extremely uh, friable. They're very fragile. And once you get, the, once you grab the tip, then it's no longer tapered, round, perfect as it was meant to be, and then it will be crooked, uh, which means that you will be unnecessarily tearing the wall the next time you're putting it in. So what you should do is really uh, not grab this uh, tip region at all. And then closing of the uh, of tying of the knot, that's also really really important. And um, I'm. Uh, I'm actually um, always saying, you know, you need to uh, be able to um, um, really tie with your eyes. You should never tie this uh, feeling the, uh, uh, the tension itself. What I usually say is once you feel the tension in the thread itself, then, you're, then it's way too hard. Then you've damaged the tissue. And sometimes in bigger uh, vessels, uh, you can do it. But there's actually a model we have, and I'm going to show you in a minute, uh, which shows you how to do this best. So microsurgery is about tying the knot with your eyes. Normally, you tie the knot, uh, feeling the tension in your hands. But here, you are not allowed to feel any tension in your instruments to begin with. And in order to best train this, we have a couple of models which are called the leaf suture. So where we actually, as you see here, this is an, uh, an 8 uh, nylon, <clears throat> we just uh, make a cut in the leaf itself and tie the leaf, such as here. We've used a spatulated needle, so you still see that because of the spatula of the needle and the, the, the cutting part, you still have these big holes. And um, we're actually going to publish this in a moment, uh, a couple of weeks now, I think. Uh, this is the pedal training model uh, from myself and my, my, my mentor, uh, Dr. Dummers, and also the one which has taught me uh, all of these techniques and which I'm uh, forever thankful, Dr. Zanfiesco from Bucharest. Uh, uh, he's a master microsurgeon, a master plastic surgeon. He does the most uh, complicated repairs and reconstructions. And what we're actually doing here is the, this is a rose pedal, and we're, uh, and we're uh, inserting... Uh, 10-0 uh, uh, sutures inside it, and as you can see, we're actually suturing the pedal itself. And as you can imagine, this is very, very fragile. So once you're once you've inserted your needle, um, then you need to apply just the right amount of pressure in order to not just the right amount of tension in your knot in order to not tear it apart. So this is a for us uh, a very good uh, training model, um, and I. I've actually read a couple of uh, articles saying this is way too fine in order to be actually used at face value. But uh, if you uh, if you'll see our article uh, once we published it, then uh, then we'll show that this uh, this has a lot of potential in uh, in uh, getting the feel and the finesse required to do microsurgery. And these are a couple of uh, this is a chrysanth uh, pedal uh, with it, uh, some tenos. This is uh, also a rose pedal. But you see some 9-0 uh, um, sutures here. This as well. And here they use the spatulated needle. So these are unacceptably big. As you can see them here. If, we, if I blow this up, then you'll see that these uh, holes, they're unacceptably big. So um, uh, what we strive for in our training model is to have as, as, as uh, small holes as possible and really not get to this. But in order to do that, then you need to uh, use uh, a round body uh, taper point uh, uh, tenno sutures. So then we get to vessel anastavosis, and then I, uh, I, I have to mention this guy. Uh, this guy is called Alexis Carell. And um, Alexis Carell was a vascular surgeon in Lyon. And he was, uh, as you can see, he's also appeared on Time magazine. And I always mention him. He's uh, due to his political views and his philosophy on life. He's not really a, a, a person which is mentioned often, but he was a genius. He got the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology, and he actually solved a problem which was deemed by generations and generations of surgeons 
if you if you go to the Royal College of Surgeons in London and you read the uh, the extracts at that time, you know uh, what they were saying about heart surgery uh, that it's totally impossible; they will never be able to do it. And obviously, vessels that we will never be able to uh, to um, sew the vessels together because the vessels are a circle. And at that time, surgeons could only uh, suture straight lines. So what Alexis Carrel geniusly thought, he said, well, you know, a vessel is pretty flexible. So if you pull it on three, si on three sides, which he called the triangulation method, then you don't have a circle anymore. You have a triangle. And a triangle means that you can just uh, suture the three uh, wounds together like this. And then you have uh, a sutured uh, vessel. And you just let it go, and it's fine. It stays, and guess what? It actually happens. We don't lose the, the we don't use the triangulation method anymore. But his brilliance and his showing of of um, of this method proves how ingenious uh, people uh, can be, and surgeons can be, and should be. Uh, we should still be doing it uh, nowadays, and uh, we should never forget the old because that will take us to the new. And what he actually did at that time, he was one of the only people which could do this. Uh, French paper was pretty thick at the time, and he was using these straight needles. He, he had no uh, curved needles. And he would be training every day um, because he didn't believe in going with the needle all the way through the wall. So what he would be doing is he would be um, inserting the needle in the, uh, uh, in the middle tunic of the vessel wall, so in the muscular tunic and he would take it out in the muscle tunic on the other side. So he would not pierce the intima. We, we're doing it nowadays because we know that it helps and that his uh, technique is unnecessary, but uh, you know, he was the forefather and that's what he thought at, uh, at the time. And at that time he was one of the only surgeons who could do it and he would train himself by actually stitching uh, paper together. Paper was much thicker at the time in France, so he would, uh, he would, he would uh, train himself by, uh, uh, by stitching together uh, two pieces of paper. And uh, at the University of Lyon, they actually had here a statue of him, which we had taken down due to, the, as I said, political reasons. Um, so what do we do nowadays in order to, um, to uh, microanastomosa vessel. Well, you can see here, this is a uh, rat femoral uh, artery. This is the inferior epigastric. So we're placing the vessel clamps here, which can slide here. Um, and then uh, we're going to cut it. And once you cut a vessel, um, because of its uh, elastic laminae, it actually retracts with about 50%. So you need to uh, take that into consideration when you're going to be sewing it back together, that you leave a little bit of space here because the vessel will be will be uh, much more elastic, so there will be there. You need to pull these two edges together with the help of your micro clamp, but you should also leave some space and just try to gently pull these uh, back together using your knots, because uh, there's some uh, elastic recoil here which you need to compensate for. And then you irrigate the vessel lumen with some uh, warm saline. And some of the some people in a classical Ackland teaching says you should not be doing trimming of the adventitia. Um, I've actually said here a question mark because uh, we don't really do it. The idea behind the stripping of the adventitia is once the adventitia gets inside the vessel wall, that's thrombogenic. So everything you do to a vessel wall which damages it unnecessarily because even you know just just getting uh, the best uh, needle and the smallest uh, uh, thread if you if you get it inside the vessel wall that's really a damage to its structure so you need to do as little damage as possible in order to be as little thrombogenic as possible because the worst thing you can have uh, after you've sewn vessels together is to have thrombosis of the vessels. That's something everybody's afraid of. And while in plastic surgery, if you do this uh, for um, for for uh, free flap, you know you have a sentinel graft. You see that it's getting white or it's getting uh, congested, and you can uh, you can pretty much um, know if there's a problem with your free flap. If you do this in neurosurgery, by the time your patient's hemiplegic. That's, that's the time that you're going to figure out that you have a thrombosis or, or a fail of anastomosis. So, you know, the, the, the organ uh, which we're using for 
the organ which needs uh, vascularization is much more uh, eloquent here and also fail of anastomosis is only apparent uh, when the bridge is uh, when there's a when a bridge is too far has been crossed that means that once your patient has symptoms the ischemia and the neurons is uh, is too much so there's really nothing you can do so in order to prevent this from happening you have to be as trained as possible I call this uh, jokingly Olympic Games so you train almost every day for something which you obviously would be doing maybe I don't know 10 20 times a year or in huge centers like uh, like those professor Tanikawa uh, he, he he might reach you know 200 a year but I don't think there are any European or American centers that reach that but you know you train every day for something which you might be doing you know five ten maybe if you're lucky twenty times a year um, but that's you know that that's what the techniques asking for it asks for perfect results and uh, I've been trained in the tradition where microsurgeons would be judged upon the patency of their anastomosis and what my master always said um, a really good microsurgeon needs to uh, get 95 percent 98 percent of the anastomosis which is done in the last year they need to be patent uh, so obviously you strive for 100 percent but uh, due to factors that maybe are not related to you uh, you can also um, accept between 95 and 98 percent but that you should really not go any lower than that so that's 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 something we, we we're trying and this is, and the anastomosis rate also goes for everything that you're doing so if you're doing a rat model if you're doing uh, rabbit replantations, if you're doing swine or anything, anything living, where there's a testable anastomosis, your patency rate for the last year should be between 95 and 98 percent. So the reason, going back to adventitia, the reason we're stripping the adventitia is to not let it get inside uh, the vessel lumen and to be thrombogenic. But you know, uh, the vessels of uh, of the head do not have uh, the intracerebral vessels do not have a they have a thin layer of arachnoid which is covering them and even for if it's not a very big vessel it's, it usually doesn't have too much adventitia so the stripping just damages the, uh, the, uh, the, the structure and then some people also do uh, dilation of the vessel N with uh, vessel dilators this also this stuns the smooth muscle cells and, uh, and then you get less vasospasm but also uh, this is uh, contested by some sits uh, I usually say, you know, if it's really, really necessary, you can do it, but um, um, the less you need it, the better. And then, uh, as I said before, you know, uh, it's this rule of uh, 90 degrees and uh, gentle counterpressure uh, from the forceps, uh, as you see here. Uh, and you'll do these corners first, the, uh, um, these two uh, corner sutures first. Um, this is a bit, uh, the, this uh, technique that I'm showing you here is a bit old fashioned because uh, this is uh, one which has been done by, by a master in, uh, in Romania. Um, and what he's actually going to show is he's going to put a little bit of tension in the, in the vessel wall because the vessel not only retracts like this, but it also retracts in its diameter. So the diameter of the vessel is much larger here than seen, but it retracts with about 50%. And then the technique is pretty uh, straightforward. You just uh, um, do the uh, front wall first, and then the back wall, and then you're done. Um, obviously, uh, it's not as simple as it sounds uh, because every time, you know, uh, as you see here, a vessel once it's cleaned up and there's no more blood and uh, there's no uh, blood pressure, it it really uh, collapses to uh, a gelatinous mass. And sometimes it's pretty difficult to see what the lumen is, but once you do this a couple of times and you're training live animals, then you get a feel of where what the intima looks like. It looks a little bit gooey, it has a little bit of, uh, of a different shade than the rest of the vessel. So if you have a, enough experience, you, you begin to see. But if you, you know, what you don't know, you don't see. That's something that Professor Yeshargil always says. And um, you don't also you don't always have to do loose stitches. Uh, there's a big review on uh, by uh, Dr. C. M. Yonov from the Cleveland Clinic. She's uh, uh, you know one of the famous um, 
uh, people are the first one to perform a facial transplant in a human. Uh, she's done a lot of research in uh, hemifacial transplant, one of the master microsurgeons of our day. And she did a huge review on, on, on techniques. Uh, you can see here a continuous suture. This is from her book published in 2015. Um, or an interlocked uh, continuous. Uh, you can also try other things like uh, um, even a vertical mattress uh, type or uh, even uh, cutting uh, fish mouthing the vessel and just uh, doing a couple of stitches here. Um, and what she found out is that actually all of these techniques uh, in the results which are published in the literature right now, as long as you're really good in them, uh, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. I have a light preference for uh, for uh, loose uh, uh, the loose knots, and that comes because um, you can um, uh, you, you if you're good enough, obviously, and if you have enough experience, then the tension in all of the knots will be the same. Um, and what you also have is you can uh, see the distances, the distance of the bite and the distance between the knots is much easier and better um, uh, thought of in the loose than in the continuous suture. But once again, if you're more familiar with the continuous technique and your anastomosis rate, your patency rate is good enough, then there's absolutely no reason to say that you should be always doing uh, loose knots. At the people I'm training, and uh, the way I train is I, I usually do loose knots. I, I find it, it gives a little extra edge on uh, on the uh, uh, anastomosis. And then you'll be asking, okay, so what is actually the reason why you need to, you know, have perfect distances and always take the same bite, etc.? Well, the more perfect it is, uh, the better your anastomosis will be. So if you have always the same distance here, there will not be any creases, there will not be any folds in the vessel wall, and you'll know that they're perfectly approximated. And in, in order to perfectly approximate it, you need to evert the vessel wall, as you will see here. So as you see, we've done the first stitch. We're going to do the second one. And then this is a bit of an old-fashioned way of uh, putting a little bit of tension in the vessel wall. So you see we're actually dilating the vessel also on this axis, not, also on, not only on this axis. And what you also notice here is there's a little bit of difference. There's a little bit of distance in the vessel ends which we'll be bringing together with the knots. So we're going to be doing a little bit of traction tension on this axis and a little bit of traction and uh, tension on this axis. Once you get better and more comfortable with the technique, you can renounce this, uh, the tension on this axis. But you should also be, but you should always be very careful um, uh, how you insert uh, the needle and, and how many stitches you, you'll be doing. That's obviously something which comes from experience. You don't want to have too many stitches because then it will be uh, occlusive, but you don't have to want to have too little because if you have too little, um, your anastomosis will not be enough. So what you see here is we're actually doing an adventitia to adventitia, media to media, and intima to intima eversion. So the, the, the vessel wall will be coming like this up, and the vessel wall will be coming like this, and they will evert nicely. And a good eversion, intima to intima contact, is the one that ensures that uh, you always have a nice result and that there's no adventitia uh, from the outside coming inside a vessel and, and, uh, and sacrificing. And this is the, the end result. Uh, now, how can we solve size discrepancies? So sometimes you have two vessels which you're trying to anastomose end to end and one is larger and one is smaller, so what can you do? Well, if you cut at about a 30 to 45 degree angle and um, sew this point to this one and stitch this one to this one, then you'll see that because of the uh, tension which you can bring on, the, on this axis of the vessel, they can come together. Now, this discrepancy is good up until about a three to one ratio. If there's more than a, if there's a three to one ratio, then you need to fish mouth it. And that means cutting it uh, longitudinally across the fibers. However, uh, the problem here is uh, this point right here, um, uh, the tip of your fish mouth, is obviously a weaker point than the rest. And that could be a side of formation of a, of a, of a false aneurysm right there because the vessel wall is, is thinner 
And, and even though you can anastomose this nicely, uh, th that's still uh, a danger. So if you have this kind of, um, uh, of situation, then you can do else, uh, which is called an uh, interpositional graft. And this is an interpositional graft. It may, uh, just means that you're going to take another vessel, which you don't need, uh, like uh, maybe the radial artery or the cephalous vein. And then you can try to... Uh, so these two end to end, and these two ends also end to end, uh, thereby bridging this distance. So every time you have a really big distance, which you cannot uh, surmount in any way, then you should have this uh, at hand. And this is also a good technique uh, uh, in in uh, in, this, uh, in neurosurgery when you have like a, a sinus bleeding or. Um, uh, there's something happening with uh, one of these cerebral sinuses, uh, and you have you need to do a reconstruction. This is a very handy technique to uh, uh, to do. And the most uh, used technique in uh, microsurgery is the uh, end to side anastomosis. So um, this is uh, the receiving vessel, and this is donor vessel. This would sometimes be the superficial temporal artery, and this would be uh, one of the M4 cortical branches. And what you're doing is uh, you're going to be stitching these two ends together and these two ends together and then the front and the back wall. And then uh, blood will be coming from, in this case, the external carotid artery to an ischemic or uh, not well enough vascularized area of the internal carotid or in this uh, case, the uh, middle cerebral artery. And then you have some patency tests. This is the milking test of Aquilin. But, you know, uh, I think nowadays uh, one would be more um, akin to using uh, intracy endocyanine and green. And you can immediately see um, what your vessel looks like on the inside, if there's an occlusion, if there's thrombus forming, how fast uh, the, the blood uh, flows distal to your anastomosis, how fast your blood flows uh, uh, when you're comparing it to other cortical vessels, and so on. So really, ICG is much better than, than the old-fashioned uh, uh, techniques. Uh, this would be, uh, for instance, an interpositional graft uh, done in a, in a rat model. So this is uh, the femoral artery, and this is the femoral vein. And we've taken the uh, superficial epigastric vein and sewn it on one end and on the other end, and this is what it looks like perfectly patterned, so this is a really useful technique to have in your mammatarium. Um, and this is uh, this is uh, actually a superficial temporal artery to M4 bypass. You see here the sylvian fissure, uh, uh, frontal lobe, temporal lobe. There's uh, uh, this is uh, this is an uh, internet case done by uh, one of uh, Japanese uh, colleagues, a uh, very skilled uh, microsurgeon. And you also see that he's using LFO uh, sutures, not the Tenno, which we're normally using. And this is what it looks like afterward. You can also use a, an 11-O uh, uh, if you're doing a microsurgery, but you know a 10-O would do just as fine here. He's done uh, eight stitches, and uh, it's the, you could uh, you could maybe solve this with uh, he's done here ten stitches with 11-O. Uh, maybe be able to solve this with eight 10-O. Uh, but you know it's really a, a matter of preference. Uh, the smaller your thread is, the smaller your uh, your uh, your needle, the less uh, damage you do to the vessel wall. And what you're seeing here is a beautiful eversion. So the vessel wall has come, uh, is, is coming towards us and is not going inside because if it would be going inside, then uh, you'd have the danger of adventitia coming into contact or, you know, this uh, arachnoid membrane coming into, uh, and, and the adventitia of the uh, superficial temporal coming into contact with the blood, which would be uh, pretty bad. So this is uh, also uh, an anastomosis of the femoral uh, vein and artery of uh, over rat. And this is uh, for bypasses, uh, a, a training model where we take the carotid of a rat and uh, anastomose to the aorta and to the uh, vena cave and then we, uh, we uh, put a clip on the aorta distally so all the blood flows uh, through the vena cava like this. And then you see very beautifully how uh, pink blood is going inside the vena cava, which would normally not be possible. And this is one of the slides which I really like showing. Um, this is uh, actually a study which was done in uh, about the 1980s, uh, published in uh, in microsurgical uh, in, a, uh, in a microsurgical uh, uh, journal. 
And what they actually did is they took um, vessels uh, which they scanned uh, on the electron microscope. And these are vessels which have been anastomosed. So look at these huge craters here, right? This is the intima. Um, and these are the, the knots on the inside of the vessel. And look at these giant craters, right? So these were perfect anastomoses which were functioning nicely. And once you look inside, you see these giant craters. Well, the problem is with these giant craters, look at this. Right, this is also scanning electron microscopy. Look at this thread, right? The vessel wall has been strangulated here. It's been pulled far too tightly. This, the, 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 the surgeon here probably felt the tension. And look at these small dots here. Those are all thromocytes, right? Do you see these walls and the thromocytes? This is asking, this is really danger of, of, uh, of thrombosis. So the less of these huge craters you have and the less of these vascular folds, the better. So the technique really has to be perfect in order to avoid these things. And look at this, this has been a this is a heel vessel wall, all flowing nicely, but you still have this crevice, this crease here in the vessel wall. And that's you know, it, the, the less of this you have, the less turbulent flow and the better it is. Because um, you know maybe it's a it's Maybe you're bypassing a, a region that doesn't need so much blood flow. But if you um, if you have a turbulent flow on top of a region which doesn't which doesn't need so much blood flow to begin with, then you're really at a danger of uh, of thrombosis, even though you may have had a, a perfect anastomosis. So the main point here is, you know, if you can avoid this by any means necessary, that's what microsurgical training should accomplish. And this is a beautiful picture of Dr. Rotan, which uh, um, emphasizes what an ECIC bypass would be. So uh, from the external carotid, uh, you would be tunneling a, a conduit, maybe radial artery, maybe saphenous uh, vein to one of the M2 segments. And then you get vascularization if there's a problem uh, of the middle cerebral artery here. Um, and what we did this year, beginning of this year, we published a new technique of um, of the uh, uh, anticyte anastomosis. What you see here is uh, our, it's just a really simple model. We use uh, latex uh, vessels, uh, uh, Japanese ones, which are very high quality, uh, have the same feel of, uh, of real vessels. We use them for training sometimes. Sometimes we use uh, uh, also live biological models, but uh, we also use uh, um, other models such as uh, uh, chicken legs. And um, what we actually thought uh, of this one um, is we thought, how can we make the anticyte anastomosis faster? Because you not only have to uh, stitch as good as possible, you have to stitch as fast as possible. Now, when you're beginning with uh, training, that's not really an issue uh, speed that comes with more experience. But the better you get, uh, the, the less time uh, it has to take. And so the less ischemia time, the better. And what I learned is, you know, a really good microsurgeon can uh, do an anastomosis pretty good in 15 minutes. I've seen Professor Tanikawa, I can do it in like 12. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, we can get maybe even lower than that. Um, so what, what we thought about is, you know, just instead of just loosely uh, tying the knots, uh, and in order to help with the version of the vessel wall, um, what we do is we insert, after doing the corner sutures, we insert the thread almost all the way, and then instead of just leaving the needle uh, outside of the operating field, we just insert it again in the vessel wall. What that does is it helps the wall stay inverted. You can always see the size of your bite and if it's equal to the other one. And then you see much better what the distance is between your knots. And the only thing what you need to look out for here is to not tie the knot on the needle itself. And another uh, good thing about this technique is uh, once if you insert your needle almost all the way, um, when you're going to get it, there's no time wasted on uh, properly uh, inserting it inside the needle holder. You can just grab it in the right position and immediately insert it again. So these are all small modifications which add to um, uh, to reducing the time needed to perform the anastomosis while keeping it as, as, as good as possible. 
Now the last one I want to talk about is uh, um, super microsurgery. Super microsurgery is uh, um, something which is new. Um, it's been done for a while. Look at this one. Uh, uh, some experience with the anastomosis of arteries uh, of about 0.2 millimeters. Um, super microsurgery is anastomosis of vessels under 0 0.8, 0 0.5 millimeters in diameter. You can imagine those are very, very small vessels. Everything which you're doing uh, to them uh, basically damages the structure and um, so you need special instruments which are extremely um, difficult to find uh, they're not so readily available which are very very fri fragile and um, which cost a lot because they're the production value is enormous and you need special needles and, and threads for it so this has been going on for a while um, there are a couple of conferences uh, uh, which have been going on um, the last couple of years. Uh, the plastic surgeons are, are using this uh, technique uh, more and more. Look at this, right? So this is a small, very small uh, seat. And this is a normal 10 needle. And look where we've gotten to. I'm not sure if it's very well visible, but uh, let me just blow this up a bit. Um, this is the smallest needle and thread we have uh, nowadays. It's uh, it's about uh, 35 microns in diameter, and Kron Jun from from Japan uh, is producing them. And look at this one, right? So this is uh, this is a regular 10O needle, and this is the new 12O with the thread. It's it's unbelievably tiny. It's really difficult to manipulate, but uh, it's useful for a replantation of like baby thumbs uh, or really small, uh, you know, reconstructions of the hand of children, uh, very small patients. Look at this one. Um, this is a new type of uh, super micro forceps. This is the uh, old type, 0 0.1 millimeter. This is 0 0.015 millimeters. And this is also Japanese, and this is a type of Japanese microscope, which can, uh, as I've told you, a regular microscope goes all the way to 12.5, 15 times magnification. Well, this one goes to all the way to 50. Uh, so, uh, the, the new uh, model goes all the way to 75 which is uh, obviously amazing. And well, um, there are two aspects of, of, of super microsurgery. The first one is I think uh, more of us should be training in super microsurgery techniques not only to better this uh, field but also to get ahead and also to get even better uh, than we were. Um, and the second is, you know, I'm convinced that super microsurgical techniques will become available for neurosurgeons to use in the time to come. What I've heard from Japan is that they that they've uh, had a couple of cases where they, they they need to do they need to do bypasses for for moya moya in babies and uh, uh, superficial temporal arteries of about 0 0.5 millimeters. So slowly but surely, we're going to find the proper indications in neurosurgery as well. So um, I think if we could include this for uh, some people to train in, even though it's very expensive and the, the way in which you train here is uh, extremely difficult, requires a lot of time and really requires uh, daily practice. Uh, this, is, this is just like playing an instrument on uh, and, uh, um, you know, giving, a, giving a concert. Uh, you really need to do this every day. If you don't do this for a week, and you'll feel it immediately uh, in your hands and in your reflexes. So I think you know more of us should be training here and 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 attempting these techniques because once you know, once you master it, then the indications will also come. Obviously, it's very important that we think about it and that we don't not just do something uh, for the sake of doing it, not just anastomos uh, vessels uh, to each other because we can. Because it's uh, because it's simple and because uh, we master the technique, but we really need to make sure that we're doing uh, something good for our patients. And I think this might be one of the areas uh, to invest in in the future of neurosurgery when it comes to vascular. I actually had a talk with someone about you know will robots uh, micro uh, micro of surgical robots be replacing the uh, microsurgeons in the future? Really, I think not, because if you take a microsurgeon which is good enough that he always has the perfect entry point, always perfect reflexes, then a robot will actually not bring any bring anything new to the table. It will really not perfect the technique in any way. And uh, in, in a narrow field, the hand of the 
human controlling an instrument, once the instrument is really uh, uh, just an extension of the hand itself, there's really nothing a robot can, can bring. But I'm not against technical uh, wonders. I mean, uh, if that's the future, I'll be, uh, I'll be more than happy to play a part in it. But I think uh, we still need to train, but this needs to be taken as serious as possible, beginning from really just latex sutures and, uh, and, and, and some leaf sutures and all the way to uh, the last anastomosis. And uh, what I say is, you know, your next anastomosis should always be your best one. That's the that's also why we do petal sutures. That's also why we we're into super microsurgery because the next anastomosis you do should always always be your best one. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Victor, for this presentation. Uh, I, I have a question, if, if uh, sure. you may. Uh, I have two questions, in fact. Uh, my first question is, can you talk a bit more about the indications that would uh, need super microsurgery uh, in uh, microsurgery today? And my second question is, what can you do with uh, the occluding incidence in, in the vascular system of the brain? I mean, if an occlusion comes and infarction uh, can take place, what can you do? Uh, or, or, and uh, how, how is this connected with the anastomosis? Uh, I'm thinking more precisely about indications as well. Thank you. Yes. Um, so, Slaven, thanks for your question. Um, with regard to the first question, I'm pretty sure, um, I'm pretty sure one of the uh, essentials fields you could maybe use it in is, is, is perforating arteries. Perforating arteries are uh, 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 one of the subjects I like most, uh, their anatomy and, and their distribution and their patterns. Um, and I'm pretty sure if you master these techniques and you would have the proper tools in neurosurgery, you might do something uh, very complex reconstructions for, you know, meningiomas which are in that area, brainstem problems, etc. But that's really high risk surgery, right? So super microsurgery should not be taken lightly because those are enormously small vessels. They're usually located in very deep, uh, uh, they're not so easily accessible. So it's, it's not something to be taken lightly. But, you know, if we begin um, uh, by the beginning, then we should first master the technique and then uh, uh, see where uh, the future takes us. Uh, I, I'm not really sure right now. Because, you know, lenticular striates, if they're big enough, then you can do replantations. But uh, one thing I didn't talk about is the more uh, arteries you replant in one conduit, the bigger the risk of having a uh, uh, of having a thrombosis because of the turbulent flow which you're inserting inside your uh, inside your graft. That's uh, question number one. And question number two is um, what you're asking me is if your bypass fails because of thrombosis, right? What can you do? Is that the question? Uh, yes, this was this was the question. Uh, what can you do in uh, in an occlusion that already occurred? What uh, can you do something with these methods? Um, if if an occlu if an occlusion already occurred, then obviously you can do something for your methods. And if you look in the literature, there are certain centers which aren't doing, you know, of uh, Mr. Clean and the trials of doing mechanical thrombectomy. Well, if you look in the literature, there are certain uh, areas in Korea and Japan, and uh, by Professor Tanikawa and Sapporo, they actually do mecha mechanical thrombectomies uh, where they uh, do uh, well they. They open up the skull in, uh, in a, an amazing uh, 25 minutes. The skull's open, and then they actually uh, cut open the vessel and pull out uh, surgically uh, the thrombus and then uh, stitch it back together. Or uh, you could perform a, a bypass, but uh, uh, the problem was uh, the, the two trials, the COS trial and the STMCA bypass trial, they both failed. Uh, but you know that's 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 a different. Uh, uh, that's a different discussion which we'll be having at a certain point, but, uh, but, but not now. But the problem is that, that uh, randomized trials have, ha have failed. Thank you. Thank you very, very much.
Th thank you very much, Victor. Brilliant presentation, well illustrated. And Carlos, do you have any questions you want to ask Victor? Carlos is a neurosurgeon from Ecuador. Hello. Um, just to congratulate for a uh, good presentation uh, for this uh, case, but we know that uh, the an vascular unit is a very strange and a very short case uh, in, the, in the world because uh, at this time um, there are uh, artery constructions in, in the Yeah, I'm sorry, we're having problems with connections here. Yeah. Um, That's too bad because I really want to hear his question. Okay, uh, Carlos, can you write your questions in the Google chat and I'll ask Victor, okay? Uh, yeah. In the meanwhile, Victor, yeah. I want to ask a question. Your training is a neurosurgeon in the Netherlands, correct? Right, correct? right, right. Now, do, do they give you time to study microsurgery during your residency training? Yeah, we, uh, we have that as, uh, well, it's not really an apart curriculum. Um, every once in a while, we, we as, as, uh, as residents can go and train uh, in a lab. But uh, I do this uh, at home. You can do this at home. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's a, grow, it's a beginning field in neurosurgery, correct? It's not really a beginning field. There are centers which are, you know, have been doing this for years and years, and actually uh, they began at almost at the same time as the plastic surgeons at Bunky and Aachen. But um, for some areas, it's, you know, even in the in the high volume centers, they don't do a lot, except for, you know, really very specific centers like Sapporo in Japan, when they do where they do really a lot, or. Uh, uh, Mount Fuji uh, Hospital uh, by uh, Professor Inoue. They they're doing a lot of uh, of bypass surgery there, but these are really very agglutinated centers in the world where they do high volume, like 100, 200, maybe a year. But uh, for the rest, it's you know the the, the volume uh, of cases is not that uh, not that high. Okay, the other specialties in which it's used, you mentioned plastic surgery and general surgery. Is it used significantly? No, in general surgery, not so much. They do use it in uh, urology, uh, like uh, they they use they use a lot of uh, microvascular reconstructions in uh, in urology, but also uh, you know like uh, reversal of uh, uh, vasectomies. They use uh, microsurgery for that. Uh, so it's a pretty popular and obviously ophthalmology. Uh, you need uh, microsurgery for ophthalmology. You know, stitching of the cornea back. That's also a nino uh, nylon uh, you'd be using for. Okay, uh, we just happen to have someone from Japan here, Simon. Hello, uh, I'd love to hear uh, Carlos's question. I wonder if he can put that in the chat okay, box. Okay, let, let me check his. Let me check the uh, chat. Well, go, go, yeah. continue, Simon. You have a sure. question. Well, that's happening. Yes, of course. I was very interested to hear uh, some comments on Japan because that's why I'm where where I am, and uh, um, hopefully at some point I can find out more about uh, neurosurgery, microsurgery in Japan. Uh, my question is uh, uh, regarding what what it was really that made you uh, decide that you wanted to follow neurosurgery uh, when you were a medical student. What was the turning point? Um, other things I was very interested in your presentation uh, was, of course, a question you already answered. I was thinking about whether Da Vinci could be used in this case, but you were saying, of course, it's the still it's the the neurosurgeon's skill that is the determining factor there, but um, another thing that was really amazing to me was you were talking about how the vena cava was connected to the aorta and the mouse. That was fantastic. Um, but what was it that made you choose uh, neurosurgery over everything else? Thank um, thanks for your question, Simon. So um, let me just uh, let me just say that again. I have an uh, amazing amount of respect for uh, Japanese uh, neurosurgeon, microsurgeons, especially. Uh, the World Federation of Reconstructive Microsurgery has a very good representation uh, from Japan and also all neurosurgical societies and uh, once again I consider Professor Tainkawa from Sapporo one of the, uh, I think the best in the world at this point of uh, cerebrovascular bypasses um, and uh, you know if, if, if you see that, that they're really at the forefront of this uh, super microsurgery also uh, but also Microsurgical techniques in general, they're really at the forefront of this. So if you if you if you want to see volume cases, uh, ideas, etc., you know you you, you, you in, there's no better place to be than Japan. Really, I need Especially to look my eyes. 
Thank yeah. you. Uh, so that's one. And and the second one made me choose uh, neurosurgery. Well, you know, uh, ever since uh, ever since I was a small boy, anatomy was, was amazing for me. It really interested in me. Uh, once I got into medical school, neuroanatomy was fascinating, and, and Al Rotham's work. Uh, it's been following me for 10 years now. Uh, I told John this. And at a certain point, you know, you get into neurology, you find the diseases interesting, you see, you, you see what the, the, the possibilities are, and then you get into microsurgery and you say, okay, well, uh, you know, microsurgery and uh, neurological diseases and, uh, and neuroanatomy, well, that, that can only be one specialty there, and there's really no other specialty for me. Um, and, and obviously, no disrespect for the plastic surgeons, I, they're amazing plastic, plastic surgeons I worked with, and, and Dave actually taught me so much uh, about everything, uh, all specialties, you know, uh, uh, my utmost respect for neurotologists, uh, among others, but there's really no other um, uh, specialty for me as an individual. Thank you. Uh, Victor, uh, Carlos Umaguano, a neurosurgeon from yeah. Quito, has, uh, doesn't have great con internet connections, but he asked me a question to ask you. Uh, he asked me, what are the possibilities to do vascular training and where? I guess regarding microsurgery. Well, um, that's actually a, um, a question which I get asked a lot, um, and it's it's pretty difficult if you want to do it on a, on a very organized level, because uh, very often you don't have a big training lab with all the facilities and a tutor that's always there. Um, so one of the um, the, the hot topics of microsurgery journals are actually people building um, uh, sort of improved uh, and improvised um, lab at home. So you you know you can get for two hundred dollars a pretty good microscope. For one hundred dollars you can get a really good um, uh, microsurgery instrument set. And then once you have training, you need a couple of you know I, I'm I'm really for really perfecting your technique as much as possible, so you really need to do it uh, with a tutor. But once you've done that, uh, you can you can also train at home. And for, well, you know, it's a, it's an investment. It's a, It'll take you about $500 um, uh, as an initial investment, but I think uh, I think it's 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 a it's a possibility. And if you read the articles, and you you see that there are a lot of microsurgeons in the world facing this problem, and really uh, solving it in this manner. Well, we could possibly use this platform to reach other micro neurosurgeons. And Simon and I were remarking during your presentation that this what you did would be a great training uh, video for other other micro surgeons that want to learn. Uh, microsurgery. Uh, we've had interactions with the Nichols Center in Florida, which is uh, basically um, a surgical training center, and they mostly use robotics. Uh, is there any kind of collaboration between robotics and, and microsurgery? Is there any chance of collaboration there? Um, as I said, uh, there are a couple of uh, institutions which are trying to see if there's any uh, possibility of uh, developing robots which can do uh, microsurgery, but it's a bit more difficult than than just, you know, run-of-the-mill Da Vinci because, right. uh, you know, the, the, the area is very small and the movements are even finer than, than uh, when you're using a Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. um, and the, as I said, you know, uh, maybe in the future we'll have robots doing some of the work, but I'm pretty sure that a well-trained microsurgeon can get the same results or better because, you know, at the end of the day, you're guiding the, the robot, and the only thing the robot does is get that tremor, uh, get, you know, you just, just uh, make sure that you don't have that tremor so that you always insert the needle where you want it. But a really good microsurgeon, a trained one, which has the right reflexes, well, he, he can do that without the robot. So, well, well, you know, Victor, I'm going to talk to the Nichols Training Center because I believe they're not exclusively robotic surgical training. I think they're generally surgical training. And if mm -hmm. they felt there was a need for microsurgery training, maybe you guys could talk. 
Sure. I mean, I have I have my uh, I have a couple of training videos. They're really basic techniques uh, on my channel on YouTube. And uh, you know, if if you want to take this further, maybe in the future after the Rotan conferences, maybe I can uh, I can make a couple of training videos, especially for for these uh, meetings, for these hangouts, and then we can talk. Uh, and then I can show you. Okay, this is what I'm doing, and uh, I'm going to do a couple of mistakes and show you what what this is wrong. Don't do this. Uh, Etc. We maybe we can do that in the future. Well, yeah, we'll sure we'll we'll talk after about this. But I definitely want to. I see possibilities for collaboration. And uh, and gentlemen, any more questions uh, for Victor, Carlos, or Simon, Slavin? You okay? <laughs> yeah, great. Great opportunity. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. We'll talk later, Victor. Let me just wrap this up. And I'd like to thank you for taking your time. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more of you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, guys.